it was mostly about just getting outside. And I think access to nature is really one of the keys. Um, just getting out there and, and being exposed to it, seeing different the different species of birds that move through at different times of year, and, and something will really be a, a spark, a um, you know some some special uh, particular species or an event, a, a phenomenon like the migration of of geese or a big migration day for warblers in in the spring. Um, so binoculars and and a bird guide obviously are are two of the are the really the key pieces of equipment although that's starting to blur nowadays in the in these the new generation of birders a lot of the information is online or in apps not in books and a lot of birders now start with a digital camera um, and identify birds from their photographs um, more than using binoculars um, so it's really all about just getting out there and finding finding the time and the place to get out and and see some birds um, and it's one of those hobbies that I feel like the more the more you go bird watching the more you want to go bird watching it just sort of <laughs> opens up a world of uh, there's an endless endless well of things to see and things to experience and uh, it, it just builds on itself But a lot of dinosaurs had feathers, um, feathers in a sort of rudimentary form, um, so they, they couldn't fly. These were feathers more like ostrich plumes or even just bristles. Um, but uh, lots and lots of dinosaurs had feathers and, and were evolving into birds. And there was a, a big uh, meteor impact about 65 million years ago in what's now the Yucatan. And that meteor impact wiped out two thirds, three quarters of all species on Earth. So all the dinosaurs were, were wiped out by that one event, that one meteor impact. And a few species of birds survived. And all the modern birds that we see now have evolved from those few species that survived the meteor impact 65 million years ago. There's so uh, much but yes, to learn. They are the direct, the direct, direct descendants of dinosaurs. Like I said, both fascinating and a little bit scary. It is a really <laughs> terrific book, and it's beautiful as well. What it's like to be a bird, from flying to nesting, eating to seeing, what birds are doing. There's an online class today at 2 with David Allen Sibley. David, thank you for being with us and taking some of our listeners' calls.
Um, you mean mix mix the new stuff with the the seed that you were feeding that was attracting house sparrows before? Is yeah. that what you're? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, um, I want to keep I want to keep them coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you'll. Um, it's worth a try and see what happens. Um, sometimes when you do that, the, the birds like chickadees will fly up to the feeder and just sort of rake through <laughs> all of the seed. Um, the millet and other sort of low-quality food that they don't want, they'll just rake through it and throw it out on the ground until they find a peanut and then fly away with that. So you might end up then with house sparrows on the ground eating all the food that's been that's been spilled <laughs> and the chickadees still using the feeder. But um, I've heard about a trick for keeping house sparrows away from feeders, which is just tying some monofilament fishing line strands to the feeder, which... For some reason, it scares away the house sparrows, but not the other species. Um, you might give that a try also, but the reason, probably the reason that you're getting the chickadees and other birds now is that they're, they're birds are always making decisions about what, what's the most, the best food, <laughs> the best, what food is worth the risk or worth the trip. So if you're putting out peanuts and, and really high quality food like that, high fat content, that might be bringing in the chickadees. If you switch back to millet, they'll just stop coming because they're not really interested in that. So that's um, part of the, the equation there. They've got a lot of options for food and they're always making decisions about whether it's worth traveling the extra distance or traveling across a big open space to get some food. And for low quality food, they won't do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I suspect that if you mix the food, the chickadees will they'll probably keep coming back to get the higher quality food, but that's all they want. They won't start eating the millet. <laughs> they know yeah. what they want. My guest is David Allen Sibley. Yeah. The name of the book is What It's Like to Be a Bird.